Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is what are each of the components inside of a gas furnace and what do each of these components do. So I'm going to take you up for up close images of each of these items. So first thing right here, you have your gas line and that's coming into the electrical gas valve and then it's stopping until there's a call for heat. You also should have a valve up outside of the furnace up top and that will be in the same direction as the pipe and that will be in the on position. You also have an electrical disconnect switch and that needs to be either on the furnace or within a serviceable distance from the furnace. And you have your ground, your hot and common wires. And now your power wires, they travel over here and you have your, your hot coming in on your L1. And then your common is going to be on L2 and that will be over on your neutral bar over here. Now we're going to come in and focus on the control board and I'm going to describe how this works. You have the high voltage coming in right here and you have your common. Now the high voltage comes and stops at these relays right here. These are also relays, these black boxes. And so you need to be able to have the 24 volt control voltage up here in order to power the coil on the relay in order for the contacts to close for the high voltage. So the whole point of the control board is that the low voltage up here controls what happens to the high voltage and what component gets powered, such as the hot surface igniter or the inducer motor, which we're, we're going to get to. Right here you have your power wires for the transformer. So right here and over here, and you're powering 120 volts to the transformer, and then 24 volts comes out right here. So on the hot, you have hot 24 volt and a common. It goes through this fuse. So here's your fuse, and, and in this case you can see it's intact. This is what a blown fuse looks like, and that means that the hot wire somewhere and a, a common or a ground is basically direct shorting or there's too much current being drawn but that's what a blown fuse looks like. This is a 5 amp fuse, this is a 3 amp fuse, so you're going to see one of these on the control board. In this case the control board is calling for a 5 amp fuse, so we're going to put this right back in and you have your, your high voltage right here coming in and then the, the 24 volt alternating current needs to go through this fuse over to the R terminal. So here you have your thermostat wires, and this is how you're going to end up controlling what happens on the rest of this control board. It all has to do with what happens right here. And there are safeties that we're going to go over as well, but you have your thermostat wire. R is for your power to your thermostat. C is your common, which is your path back, and you need R and C to power a digital thermostat unless you use batteries. W is your heat, Y is your cooling, and G is your fan. And so R touches Y and G to turn your air conditioning on, or R touches G in order to turn your fan on, and R touches W to turn your heat on. So how you would check that is with a multimeter. If you wanted to know if your heat was going to be turning on, as long as you measure 24 volts between the W and the C, then you know that your sequence of operation for heat should occur. So that's the control board. It controls what happens to the high voltage based on the low voltage and it also is monitoring the safeties on this furnace. Back here you have your blower motor squirrel cage and you have a capacitor that's attached to the blower motor. Now every once in a while you want to go ahead and pull this whole blower motor squirrel cage out because you want to clean right on this wheel right here. You can do that with a shop vac and a toothbrush. And all inside here you can see that you have this accumulated uh, dust because of the humidity. It's kind of getting stuck onto the sides of the metal. So you want to go ahead and clean that out. And right here, this is a PSE blower motor, which means permanent split capacitor. It needs a capacitor right here to start and to run while the system's operating. Here's a PSE blower motor pulled out of the squirrel cage. And you can see this is where your capacitor attaches to and it has multiple speeds usually. And so these speeds are parked on the control board and they're labeled as spare usually. And the ones that are, are on the, the block right here, you're going to pick a speed and that will be uh, on the heat or the cool. In reference to the speeds, the black wire is usually the high speed, the red is usually the low speed, the blue is usually the medium speed, and orange is usually between the medium and the lowest speed. Now as far as the capacitor is concerned, what you can do to test this is turn the power off to the furnace, disconnect the wiring to the capacitor, you can discharge it with a resistor, and then you can read your MFD, which is your microfarads. It's also referred to as UF, and so 
7.5 is the rating for this one right here, and we read 7.51. So we know that this capacitor is still good, and this is needed in order to turn the, the system on for, for your blower motor and for the blower motor to run. If you find a bad capacitor and the measurements are, are lower or maybe OL when you're reading it with a multimeter, replace the capacitor with the same UF rating and the same voltage or a higher voltage than the existing capacitor. Now you may not have a PSC motor, you may have a ECM motor that's a variable speed. In this case, this is a motor module on the end, it's a control board. And one of the common things to fail in here is the current limiter. And you may have one where the capacitors go bad. In this case, you're, here you have a blown capacitor. And so this is a different version right here of the variable speed module. Here you have the interlock door switch and you have right here your, your power wire in and then your power wire out. And so basically you have a door that covers over this section because you don't want to be pulling, say, air out of a, a basement or maybe an attic or something like that. So this interlock door switch should be shut. When you're servicing a furnace, what you can do is you can just use a magnet to hold that down while you're diagnosing the problem. Make sure to remove this magnet and also uh, any electrical tape or anything else used to hold down that switch and put the door back before you leave the job site. Here you have a digital thermostat and all this is doing is acting like a switch on the inside. And so what it's doing is it's touching your R wire to your W or R to the Y and G or the R to the G only. Some thermostats are wired with a C terminal and some also have a slot for batteries. So whenever possible, make sure to utilize that C terminal. Here you have an inducer motor and what's happening is behind this inducer motor, you are pulling through a heat exchanger. So it's separating the exhaust gas from the air that's blowing through the system and it's transferring heat. And so basically the job of the inducer is to pull the, the, the exhaust from over here and it's pulling it through and it's pulling it into this assembly right here and then it's pushing it up through the exhaust. You're gonna have multiple different types of inducer motors out there. This one is a shaded pole motor so there is no capacitor and this one right here is a PSC inducer motor. So it does have a capacitor and it has a rectangle box type capacitor. So if this goes bad, make sure to replace it with the same style. And you wanna make sure to look for if there is a compartment that the capacitor is in. Don't just assume that the inducer motor is bad. Make sure you check for the capacitor. Now there's other types of inducer motors as well, such as two speed inducer motors or variable speed inducer motors. So, so they're all different. But the PSC inducer motor is the most common. The job of the pressure switch is to make sure that the inducer motor is running, it's pulling the, the correct negative vacuum in this chamber, and it's making sure that the exhaust and the intake are both not clogged. If there's a condensate trap, which I'll cover next, if that is clogged, then this pressure switch is gonna shut off when mounted back here. So this is gonna be going to a collection box, and sometimes instead of it being mounted here, the pressure switch mounts to a different position like this hole right here on the inducer motor. It just depends on if it's at 80% or 90% or how many pressure switches are actually mounted on the furnace. You could have a pressure switch that looks like this. It could look like, like this. You could have one port. You could have two ports. You could have multiple pressure switches. You could have pressure switches that are actually stacked one on top of each other and, and are connected. This pressure switch is in the normally open switch position when the furnace is off and while it's running it should be closed as long as the correct pressure measurement is, is on this tube. Now you can verify that, that pressure measurement by putting a T between here and the pressure switch and measuring it with a water column manometer. So one like this, you could also isolate the pressure switch completely and, and use a tool such as this SDMN6 because it has a built-in pump in it already. And you can test the switch out to make sure that it's accurate. But just so you know, in reference to like a PSI conversion, it takes 27.6 water column to reach one PSI. So we're talking about a very, very light pressure. This one's rated at two inch water column. This one right here is rated at 0.18 inch water column. So that's very, very small. Here you have a condensate trap, and this needs to be primed with water in order for this system to work. And if the water level rises up into the tubes and comes up over to here, it's going to shut off that pressure switch. So this condensate trap needs to get blown out every once in a while and cleaned out. You're typically going to have your three tubes connected to here. Here you have a thermal limit switch, and this is just a safety protection device in case the furnace starts to overheat. 
because it's not transferring the heat from the exhaust to the air. So this switch is going to be closed typically until it gets up to, say, in this case, 240 degrees, and then this switch is going to open, and it's not going to close back down again until it gets to 220 degrees because it's 240 minus 20. Now here's a different style of this thermal limit switch. Now these will automatically reset after the system cools down. Now here's an example of testing the thermal limit and it should be in the closed position if the furnace is cooled down. So this reads 0.0. .0. If this was open, it would read OL instead. Here you have a direct ignition electrical gas valve and you know that it's a single stage only because there's two wires. There's gonna be a hot and a common. Now the common is gonna be attached to the ground. So this right here is going to allow the the correct amount of gas flow to the main burners all in one shot. This one right here is a pilot ignition gas valve, and this is referred to as a smart valve, so it actually has the control board right on the top right here. It's the ignition control module and electrical gas valve all in one, but this one is a pilot ignition, so you see that it has to ignite right here first before it'll allow the main gas valve to, to allow the, the full gas flow through but a natural gas valve is going to allow somewhere between say 3.3 .3 and 3.8 inch water column for a single stage gas valve. And if it was propane, it would be right around 10 inch water column coming over to each of these orifices. I'm gonna show you this combustion chamber in just a minute or two, but I did wanna show you also this. If you have LP instead of natural gas, you're typically gonna have a sticker right here that says the gas valve's been converted. And if you notice something like this on the, the inlet, gas coming in, then this is a low pressure switch and it's just making sure that maybe your propane tank may be too empty to run so it doesn't want to put too low of a gas pressure into the gas valve and so that's what that is. That's just another safety switch right there. Now this one right here is a two-stage gas valve because it has a common and it has medium and high speed and you're also going to notice it has two brass screws because there's two springs right in here and so this one is a two-stage gas valve, but you may have completely uh, modulating gas valves as well in higher efficiency furnaces. Now right here is the combustion chamber, and sometimes this is sealed and sometimes it's open. On all 80% efficient furnaces, it's going to be open. On some, especially older 90% efficient furnaces, you're going to have a sealed box right here with a little peephole inside. Here you have the front of the combustion chamber. And you can see several things. This is the hot surface igniter. This is what turns cherry red to ignite the full gas flow of the direct ignition gas valve. Right here is a flame rod. And so there's nothing special about a flame rod. It's just a stainless steel rod that's inserted into the flame and it allows the, the current to travel from the, the rod across the flame to the ground. And that's your flame proving device. Basically you have your ground wire going back to the control board. This is coming from the control board over here. You're typically powering a flame rod with, or it could also be called a flame sensor, with anywhere from 80 to 180 volts. And so um, this right here, you're gonna check your, your what's called micro amps in order to see and prove that there's a flame. This right here is just powered with 120 volts. And so you can just check it. You don't have to pull this out if you suspect that it's bad or cracked. You can just test your resistance value. If it's not OL, and most likely this hot surface igniter is good. This is a silicon carbide hot surface igniter. And you wanna just replace these with the same uh, height, same size hot surface igniter because these are positioned in a certain manner so that it makes for a good ignition. So there are replacements for these that are silicon nitride and I'll show you those in just a little bit. This right here is your burner tubes and each one has a little pathway for the gas to flow across here so all four of these ignite. So right here, these ones represent 20,000 BTUs a piece on this particular model, uh, but basically they're all firing at the same time. Over here, you're gonna see two switches, one here and one here. These are your flame rollout switches and it's very important if these were to pop, they can only be manually reset by push pressing this button right here. And you need to see if there is an actual problem with the furnace. So here's your flame rollout switch. So you don't wanna press this button in continually if it's popping because what could be happening is as this whole system's running, you have these burners firing and while the blower motor is running, you have the flames popping out like this. 
And so what's going to happen is it's going to end up tripping this flame rot switch. It's a safety device in case your heat exchanger back here is, is cracked, way back in there. If your heat exchanger is cracked, you could be getting carbon monoxide in the house, and that's a serious, serious uh, safety concern. And so you need to identify if the heat exchanger is cracked or if it's not. It could be that the there's a combustion chamber right here is pulling away from uh, this back piece and it's allowing air up in here. But a lot of times this is only happening when you have a cracked heat exchanger. Now this flame rot switch is normally closed and it's going to open up if the flames come out, out to here. While I'm at this spot, I also want to show you that these are your gas orifices. And these are a particular size based on if this system's running natural gas or propane. So if you were running propane, these would certainly going to have to get ch changed out as well as your spring. And you're going to have to set your gas pressure to the correct amount. You may also have to do something with your combustion air as well. This flame rod is also known as a flame sensor, but the actual rod itself does not sense anything. All it is is a stainless steel rod that has some ceramic over it. That is it. So it doesn't need to be replaced unless it's uh, like maybe a small, small version and maybe it's overheated and bent or brittle or something like that. But in these larger ones, there's typically never a reason to replace the flame sensor, but you do want to clean it. So you want to clean the outside of that with non-soaked steel wool to make sure that uh, the electricity will, will flow properly. But up here, you have a hot surface igniter. You don't have to take this out in order to test it. You can just check your electrical resistance right here to see if it's reading OL. If it reads OL, then that means it's bad and, and broken. So here's an example of one that is bad. It's actually cracked right here in the middle. And so there on this side, you can see it a little bit better. But you can just check, check your resistance value. Your resistance value is going to be higher when the hot surface igniter is still hot. Once it cools down, it'll be a little bit lower. Uh, but this right here is an example of a silicon carbide one. This right here is a silicon nitride. So this one will last longer than the silicon carbide type. But you want to watch when you're replacing the uh, hot surface igniters, and especially if you're trying to change the type because you want a good ignition and you want the, the, sur the surface area of this or the depth of this. You know, you want to really watch that when you're trying to do a replacement for a hot surface igniter. And it's always good, certainly, if you can replace a hot surface igniter with the same version. A lot of times you have to make do as well. Uh, but the silicon nitride hot surface igniters will last longer than the carbide version. Now we're looking down onto the inside of the furnace heat exchanger area, and this is your primary heat exchanger right here. So all three of these, and then down in the inside of here, you see that there's a tube and fin heat exchanger, and that's your secondary heat exchanger. That secondary heat exchanger is able to drop the temperature of the exhaust gas so low that it's actually the temperature of your skin before the exhaust ends up exiting this furnace. And what's happening is the, the water that's in the exhaust gas is getting condensed and trickling back down into the collector box over in the front of the furnace. So that's how a 90% efficient furnace is able to transfer a lot of heat from the exhaust to the air. It needs both a primary and a secondary heat exchanger. And if you want to learn more about HVAC, make sure you check out our website at acservicetech.com where we have a bunch of articles, quick tips, the podcast. We've got quizzes, calculators, and we also have our book, workbook, and quick reference cards. And if you're looking for a video on a particular component and the troubleshooting of it, make sure to check in the description section below where we have a bunch of videos posted right there. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.